Chapter 11 is on the idea of a matrix inverse. So the first thing we're going to do is look, it's a bit more complicated with matrices. Uh, for numbers, of course, the inverse is simply one over the number. So the inverse of two is a half. We'll see what we're going to be looking at in this, uh, in this chapter uh, is an analog of that for matrices. It's, it is, uh, in fact, much more complicated. And we'll start with the fact that there's a notion of both a left and a right inverse. Okay, so uh, just to give you a rough idea, I mean, just to, the setting is, if I have a number x um, and it satisfies xA equals 1, that just means the product of it and another uh, number a is 1, then <clears throat> it's called the inverse. Uh, and of course, we just write it as 1 over a. Um, and that exists only if a is not equal to 0, because if a is 0, there's certainly no number x for which xA equals 1, because no matter what x you choose, xA is 0. Um, and of course, it's the only one. I mean, there's, there's, there's only one inverse of 2, and it's 1 half. Um, now, <clears throat> by analogy, we'll say that a matrix x that satisfies xA equals i, and notice that's the matrix analog of the scalar equation here, um, we're going to call that a left inverse, and, and it's left because x operates on the left of a. We'll see also that there's going to be a right inverse where x operates on the right of a. And, and for matrices, they're different. And of course, as you know, there's, it doesn't commute. Uh, matrix multiplication is not commutative. Uh, so they're different things. Okay, so, so if you have a matrix on the, that, that mul when you multiply uh, on the left uh, by this matrix x, uh, then times a and you get i, that's called a left inverse. And if a left inverse exists for a matrix A, we say it's left invertible. So it means, so left invertible just means there is a left inverse. So here's an example. Here's a matrix A. Um, it is three by two. Um, and you can check, I'm not going to do it. Uh, but here are two different left inverses. So already things are getting very weird uh, because you can multiply, you can check that BA is I and also CA is I. I'm not going to do that, but you can check. Um, that things are already weird, right? Because for a number, when there's an inverse, there's only one of them. No such thing as being two different numbers that when you multiply by two, you get one. Okay, so things are already a little bit strange here. Now, it's related, the idea of, of left inverses and things, like, it's related to column independence. Let's see how that is. So, the first claim is if, 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 if a matrix A has a left inverse C, then its columns are linearly independent. Okay, now let's check that. Um, well, to check that its columns are linearly independent, we'll, we'll, we'll write down the matrix equation AX equals zero. Now what that means is that uh, AX is one interpretation of it is it's a linear combination of the columns of A um, with coefficients xi. And then, of course, what we'd like to show if, if they're in, linearly independent, we want to show that the only way this can happen is if x equals 0. Um, and suppose ca equals i. That means that a has a left inverse uh, c, or a is left invertible. Well, in that case, we'll just do some matrix calculations here. Um, of course, if you make, multiply any matrix c by the 0 vector, you get the 0 vector um, of potentially different sizes. Um, but here, AX is zero, so I'm gonna plug in C times AX, and I'm going to use the fact that I can reassociate a triple product any way I like. And in the first case, I multiply A and X together first, then multiply by C. I'll switch that by first multiplying C and A. Ah, but CA is the identity, so that's IX. And now we use the fact the identity matrix times X is X. Um, and, you know, I think I said this before, but the identity you should think of as a matrix generalization of the number one. Okay, um, and if you look at this whole chain, it says x equals 0. And so what we've shown is the following. If ax equals 0, then x equals 0. And that means that the only linear combination of the columns of a, which gives you 0, is the one with 0 coefficients. And that means the columns are linearly independent. So what that says is if you have a left inverse, then your columns are linearly independent. Okay, now later in the class, uh, <laughs> Not that much later, actually. Uh, we're going to see that a matrix is left invertible um, if and only if its columns are linearly independent. In other words, if its columns are linearly independent, it has a left inverse. And we'll, we'll be able to construct one. Uh, we'll be able to show you how to do that. Um, and that's, this is the matrix generalization of the following. A, a number is invertible if and only if it is non-zero. Okay, 
then so what we can say is a matrix is left in left invertible if and only if its columns are linearly independent right so so here linear independence is serving as sort of an analog of being non-zero okay of course they're very different things a matrix can be non-zero but have dependent columns right so these are different concepts but it's the correct matrix analog um, so this tells us immediately that if a matrix is um, is left invertible it has to be tall or square um, why because if it were wide which means it has more columns than it has rows that would mean uh, that would the columns are automatically uh, the columns are immediately dependent and therefore you cannot have a left inverse okay so let's see that you know that we can solve linear equations uh, with a left inverse so suppose ax equals b that's a system of linear equations i'm not assuming it's square uh, wide tall anything okay well i will immediately uh, so a has a left inverse c that tells you actually that that means that of course uh, a is tall or square um, then we do this we see that cb is c and b is of course uh, ax i mean if x satisfies ax equals b but ca is again the identity and that's x and what we see is something very cool um, if you multiply uh, the right hand side b uh, by a left inverse you get a solution of a set of linear equations right so so that's and that's exactly like uh, let's write down the analog of this for uh, scalars right you write a x equals b and then we would write it uh, something like this we'd say well in that case um, x equals 1 over a times uh, b is actually a solution so here the number 1 over a is well it's the inverse uh, of a uh, but we can think of it also if you like as a left inverse of a and so that's that's what this tells you here so here this says that that if you multiply by c which is this left inverse you get a solution so so left inverses at least are quite useful because they allow you a left inverse allows you to solve a set of linear equations um, now later we're going to find out actually how to compute a left inverse uh, but for now we just observe that if you have a left inverse you can solve linear equations and that's useful let's look at an example so here's a it's a three by two uh, matrix here's b it's a, a three vector um, and we have overdetermined equations ax equals b it's overdetermined because there's essentially three equations and two unknowns that's how you might say it in sort of the high school language um, and uh, and it has the unique solution uh, there's only one solution of it and it's one minus one okay um, so a has two different left inverses we already saw that it's the same one we saw before here's b and here's c and by the way when you're talking about two different inverses you're definitely outside the scalar situ setting right because numbers only have one inverse but matrices can have several left uh, we'll see we'll see exactly what happens but they can have multiple left inverses um, now if you multiply the right hand side that's this b by either b or c um, in both cases you get the same you get the same x um, and the reason is in fact that this set of equations has only one solution it's a unique solution right so <clears throat> so we, you had to get this um, okay so this makes uh, this makes sense it's strange especially if you're used to the scalar setting it's strange but makes sense now you know naturally there's a concept of right inverse um, and so that says this a matrix x that satisfies a x equals i so here x appears on the right that's why it's called a right inverse that's called a right inverse of a and if, a, if, if you have a right inverse you say the matrix is right invertible um, and it turns out that the, you can we can easily I mean we could work this out separately but in fact it's closely related left and right by transpose and that makes sense because when you transpose a matrix um, you first of all you reverse the order of a matrix product and you turn rows into columns and so on so it turns out a is right invertible if and only if a transpose is left invertible uh, so in other words if you have ax equals i that means x is a right inverse of a um, if we transpose both sides of this equation we get ax transpose on the left and i transpose but i transpose is i i is a symmetric matrix meaning that when you transpose it you get the same matrix again um, now we're going to use the transpose of product rule it says that ax transpose is x transpose a transpose and now we look at this and we go cool uh, x is a right inverse of a if and only if x transpose is a left inverse of a transpose okay 
Um, and so what that means is A is right invertible if and only if the columns of A transpose are linearly independent. Um, the columns of A transpose are the rows of A. So it says A is right invertible if and only if its rows are linearly independent. And that tells us that if a matrix is right invertible, it must be either wide or square. Okay? Now, you can also solve linear equations with a right inverse. Uh, so suppose B has, A has a, a right inverse of matrix B. Um, now consider the square or underdetermined, because A in this case has to be either tall, has to be square or wide. Sorry, it has to be square or wide. Uh, AX equals B. That's underdetermined. Okay. Then it turns out X equals B, capital B, little b, is a solution. Why? Because if you take X equals uh, capital B times little b, you get AX is A times capital B, little b. We reassociate, get AB. AB is I, because a B is a right inverse of A. You get I times B, and that is B. Okay, um, so that says that the, in this case, the equations AX equals B has a solution for any B. Um, in fact, we'll see later, it has many solutions, but it, it at least has a solution for every possible B. So let's look at an example. It's going to be the same matrices as above. So A, remember, is 3 by 2, uh, and then B and C were two left inverses. Uh, of, of A, and that tells us that C transpose and B transpose um, are both right inverses of A transpose. Now we consider the underdetermined equation, A transpose X equals 1, 2. Now, A transpose is 2 by 3, and that says this is a system of two equations with three unknowns. Um, and when I multiply by B transpose, the right-hand side here, um, that's the right-hand side, if I multiply that by both B transpose and C transpose, I get a solution, but here's what's kind of interesting. In this case, I get this vector, and I get this vector. And you think, ooh, this doesn't look good. But in fact, you can check that if I multiply this by A transpose, I will get 1, 2. If I multiply this by A transpose, I get 1, 2. So this is a case where this, the, these two different right inverses actually produce two different solutions of the undetermined system of equations. <clears throat> what we're going to do now is tie this together into what's basically the, the usual, that's the more usual case, it's the simple case, um, and that's when you just have an inverse. So let's see what that is. Now, um, if A has a left and a right inverse, they are unique and equal. Okay, so in other words, uh, if A, A has to be square, of course, in that case, because it has to be tall to have a left inverse, and it has to be wide to have a right inverse. So if it has a left inverse, and a right inverse, it's got to be square. Uh, square is allowed in both cases. So <clears throat> if a matrix has both a left and right inverse, then it turns out they're, they're the same, and, and they're equal, and there's, and there's only one inverse. So we're sort of back to the old situation of a number, right? If a number A is non-zero, there is an inverse. It's called 1 over A, and it's unique. There are not two numbers that you can multiply by A and get 1. Okay. Um, now, let's, let, let, me, let me explain how these are they're actually the same. So here, suppose that x is a right inverse of a. That's this equation. And y is a, y is a left inverse. Uh, and what I'm going to show is, in fact, x is equal to y. Um, let's see how we check that. Well, we write, well, x is equal to ix. Well, we totally agree with that, because the identity multiplied by, on, if it multiplies a matrix, either on the left or right, you get the matrix back. And now I'm going to write i as ya. Right, because ya equals i. And then I'll reassociate, and I write this as y times ax. Um, oh, but wait a minute. ax is i over here. Right, so ax is i, and that says that's yi, and that's y. So if you put all this chain together, you get x equals y. So that says that if a matrix, which has to be square, of course, if it has both a left inverse and a right inverse, they're the same. The, there's, no, there's no difference between left and right inverse. Um, that's getting us, it's more comfortable, right? It's more like the situation with a number where you say, if I have a number, if it's non-zero, then x equals little x equals 1 over a is the inverse. And someone would say, is it left or right inverse? And you go, well, it doesn't matter. They're numbers. If you multiply 1 over a times a, you get 1. It's the same as saying you multiply a times 1 over a, you get 1. Um, but for matrices, it's a little more subtle, but something similar to that is occurring here. It says that if, if you have an inverse like this, um, then... Um, that then it's unique, right? It's both a left inverse and a right inverse. Okay, 
Now they're denoted as a uh, a inverse, right? A the minus one power, right? And that's very similar to um, similar to how we we work with numbers. I mean, it's weird to write. You know, people don't usually write two to the minus one. Well, they might actually, um, <clears throat> and it's basically a half, right? So so it's the inverse. It's written as a inverse. <clears throat> and what what we've seen here is that an inverse uh, when multiplied by a matrix w uh, when the inverse exists. We'll get to that later, but when the inverse exists, uh, it you can multiply it on the left by a or on the right. And these these are in general when you multiply two matrices in different orders, you get different matrices. In this case, you don't. You get the same matrix and it's the identity. Um, and you can also check uh, pretty easily that a that the inverse of the inverse is back to the matrix again. And that makes sense, right? I mean, in fact, when you talk about inverting something. Uh, it's got that feeling that if you do it twice, you get back the same thing. It's like a transpose. If I transpose a matrix twice, I get the matrix back. In this case, if I invert it twice, assuming it is invertible, then I get the matrix back, right? Um, the previous example with transpose uh, has no conditions on it, right? So at any matrix I can transpose, and if I transpose it twice, I get back the original matrix. Okay, so this is the matrix inverse. <coughs> Now, we can use that to solve square systems of linear equations. So let's suppose A is invertible, and let's look at the square system of linear equations AX equals B. Then it says that for any B, it has AX equals B has only one solution, and that solution is simply A inverse B. Okay? And, you know, this is, this is basically the matrix generalization of the scalar equation AX equals B, having the solution X equals 1 over AB. And that's for a not equal to zero, right? So <coughs> here, uh, invertible is going to play the role of a not being equal to zero uh, for a scalar, right? So that's the idea. And this simple looking formula, x equals a inverse b, that's the basis for tons of applications. Like uh, it, it could even be, there's many, there's many applications widely used where all it does, from a scientific point of view, is assemble a set of equations, ax equals b, and then solve it for you by forming x equals a inverse b. Um, now, we haven't said how to do that yet, but we will shortly. Um, so, tons of things like that. Like, if I have a, a steel structure or some civil engineering structure, and I want to find out, will it be able to handle the loads that I'm going to put on it? A wind load, uh, static loads that are inside a bridge or something like that. doesn't matter. And I want to know... How, how much is it going to deflect? Um, is it going to deflect too much? Um, that's a set of linear equations. Uh, it's AX equals B, and you simply assemble these and then solve that, and that tells you your deflection. That's a simulator for trying to figure out if I build this bridge, will it sag too much, or something like that. Okay, so that, that's, that's the idea. So this is super important. It's super natural. You have to watch out, though, because um, this is very heavily... Uh, it's, it's, it's very powerful notation, right? That, that this looks very innocent, right? You go from AX equals B to X equals A inverse B and you're like, well, sure, why not? Um, just, uh, this, this holds a lot. This, a very small number of characters is actually telling you a whole lot. This is very complicated. Okay. Now for an invertible matrix, um, there's a lot of way to say is that the say, I mean, there's a lot of things equivalent to being invertible and I'll, I'll, I'm going to list them here. So if I have a square matrix A, oh, I should say, if a matrix is not square, game over, cannot be invertible, right? Because if it's tall, it can't have a right inverse, okay? If it's wide, it can't have a left inverse. And if you're invertible, you have to have both a left and a right inverse. So if you're non-square matrix, in fact, I'll mention that now. If you write A inverse ever and A is not square, that's a crime, okay? That's that's what we call a crime against matrices. It's don't do that, right? And the reason it's a crime is because you can just it doesn't make any sense. You can check it. Uh, you can check so easily that the matrix A is square. Now, of course, a, a square matrix need not have an inverse, like the zero matrix, square zero matrix five by five doesn't have an inverse. Uh, but it's even worse just to assert that a three by five matrix has an inverse, right? Because that's so easily checked by essentially the syntax, uh, the dimensions of A. Okay, so here are some, these are completely equivalent, meaning if any one of these holds, then all the others do. So one is it's invertible. We define that to mean it has a left inverse and a right inverse. Um, it's the same as saying the columns of A are linearly independent, which, well, we, we saw one part of it. We'll see the other part later in the course. Uh, 
That's the same as saying that A has a left inverse, right? Um, but it's also the same as saying the rows of A are linearly independent, and that's the same as A having a right inverse, right? So, but the point is that any one of these is enough to tell you that all the others hold. So for example, for a square matrix, if the columns are linearly independent, then so are the rows. Um, I mean, some of these are, some are easy, right? Um, like here, uh, A is invertible implies, by definition, the definition is it has both a left inverse and a right inverse. So the fact that if A, that this implies these two is clear. What's less clear is this. It says that if a square matrix has a left inverse, it's also got a right inverse. That's what it says. If A has a right inverse, it's got a left inverse. In fact, it's the same matrix, right? Because an inverse is unique. Okay. Let's look at some examples of matrix inverses. Um, and I should say something about this. Um, <clears throat> you should know a couple of these. If it's super duper easy, you should, you should know it. Um, and, you know, I think people should know, you should probably memorize the formula for the two by two matrix inverse. Beyond that, I don't recommend it, right? It's what we have computers for, right? So um, I'll just say that. So, so, but let's look at a couple just to make sure it makes sense. So the first is says that the inverse of the identity is, well, the identity. Um, so that makes sense. I mean, and we can check. I mean, I don't know. Let's see. So does, does I have uh, independent columns? Yeah, it's, the, it's, the ba it's just the unit, unit basis. Uh, uh, let's see. This is the standard basis. Let's see, uh, is, um, what is the inverse of I? Well, it's I, and that the reason is I times I equals I, which is true, okay. Um, now, if a matrix Q is orthogonal, now, um, <coughs> that means uh, it's square uh, with Q transpose Q equals I. Now, remember what that means. Q transpose Q equals I is basically very compact matrix notation saying that the columns of Q are linearly independent. That's what Q transpose Q equals I means. In that case, I mean, just look at this equation, right? Here's a matrix Q transpose. I multiply Q on the left and I get the identity. Well, it's square. So that says Q transpose is a left identity, a left inverse, but that says because it's square, it's just the inverse. So that says that, for example, Q inverse equals Q transpose. So so for an, for an orthogonal matrix, it says that the uh, inverse is nothing but the transpose. They're the same thing. Um, notice that this also this actually has an implication. Uh, this also says that in this case, QQ transpose equals I, um, which is not totally obvious, by the way, right? So it says that uh, uh, this one is the definition of the columns being uh, of the columns being um, orthonormal, right? Uh, this is less obvious. Okay. So for a two by two matrix. I mean, you can just you can just work it out and write it out and do a bunch of algebra and stuff like that. And the truth is, you may have seen this before. So uh, it turns out there, and I, I would recommend you just memorize this. Although, on the other hand, it's not clear to me that you would come to any harm if you didn't memorize it. So actually, maybe let me let me put it another way. My 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 my, my feeling on this is. You should you should definitely know that there is a formula for the matrix inverse for the for a two by two matrix. I mean, the truth is, there's a formula for the inverse of any matrix. It's just they get huge and gigantic very quickly. But for two by two, there's a formula, and maybe that's what you should remember. And this is like what Wikipedia is for. Okay, so you just look up two by inverse of two by two matrix. Okay, so here it is. It turns out the condition is uh, there is a condition that has to hold. Because otherwise, you know, we know that not all two by two matrices are invertible. For example, the zero matrix is not invertible. Um, and it basically says that the two columns have to be linearly independent. And that just means that the second column cannot be a multiple of the first column or vice versa. Um, you can work out what that is. And it's this, it's this thing. It says that the product of the diagonals uh, cannot equal the product of the, I guess people call these the anti-diagonals, the, the one, two and the two, one entry. Um, now, some of you may have seen from another course, you'd recognize uh, this number as the determinant of a matrix A. Now, determinant doesn't really play a leading role in what we're going to say. Doesn't matter. I mean, but if, you just, if you've seen that, then good for you. Uh, but it's not going to play a, a, a role in this, in this course. Uh, and here's the inverse. I mean, it's a bit strange. It's, it's one over this mystery number. It's the determinant times here, I mean, the rule is uh, you, you switch a, you know, the 1, 1, and 2, 2 entry, and you negate the off-diagonal entries. So that's it. Um, and 
Yeah, I would say you should know this formula. It's kind of like the quadratic formula for, you know, what are the roots of a quadratic? Yeah, I, I guess it's on a it's on a short list of, I don't know, 10 silly things you should, you know, little basic facts that you should know. Um, okay, now uh, for larger uh, matrices, like three by three, four by four, five by five, there are formulas that look just like this, but they are fantastically complicated. Um, so I think even if you were to write out the formula for the 10 by 10 inverse, I don't even think you could. I mean, I, it's impossible, right? And the reason is that the complexity of the formulas kind of grows like the factorial of n. And 10 factorial is a pretty big number. So, so while there's a formula for a 10 by 10 inverse, it's, you can't write it, it, it's, it, it's not practical to write it down. And I should also add that that formula is absolutely not the way you solve or compute an inverse, right? So we'll shortly see that, in fact, the truth is, the hilarious part is you already know how to compute an inverse. We just haven't gotten there yet. Um, so, but the point is that that method is completely straightforward. It doesn't grow like the factorial or something like that. But anyway, okay, but here it is. Uh, it's a two by two inverse. And you know, you could check it. I mean, multiply this by, take this matrix here, multiply it by, you know, A, and make sure that you get I. I would recommend doing that. Okay, so let's look at a non-obvious example. Um, here's a matrix A. Um, oh, and we should talk about something. Um, it, let's talk about, first, let's talk about invertibility of numbers, okay? Well, anybody can recognize that because it's simple. If the number is not zero, it's invertible, period. So it's not a big deal to figure out if I show you a number, if it's invertible or not. It, the only question is, is it zero? Okay, now for matrices, that's false, okay? Well, unless it's two by two, in which case, here's the condition, right? Um, but um, for a bigger matrix than that, uh, no human being can just look at a general matrix and go, yeah, that's invertible. Oh yeah, no problem. Sure, that's that that's in, that's invertible, um, or or not. Um, well, there would be some obvious giveaways in some very simple cases, but generally, no. Um, I don't know if it's invertible or not. Okay, now this matrix turns out is invertible, and here's the inverse. It's it's one thirtieth times this matrix here, and you can you can just check uh, check me on that 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 works out. Um, I mean, if you like. <clears throat> let's audit one entry, uh, you know, why not? Um, so let's, let's multiply, let's say, A inverse times A, and let's calculate the 1, 1 entry. Well, I'm going to go across here and down here, and here's what I'm going to get. I'm going to get uh, 0 times 1, uh, which is 0, minus 20 times 0, and the last one is minus 10 times minus 3, which is 30. Then I divide by 30 out here, and I get 1. Okay, good. So the the 1-1 one, one entry of A inverse A is indeed 1, which is correct. It's the identity matrix. Okay, so uh, now, how do you find the inverse? I, we're going to tell you later. It's it's super duper simple. I, I, it's not a, like I just want to be weird or anything and not tell you yet. You'll see uh, soon enough that it, it, it comes up uh, and, and how to compute it. But for now, um, we're just saying, you know, this is an example of a, of, of a matrix that's invertible. Okay, now... In the inverse process um, involves, uh, you know, there's a bunch of properties that, that hold. For example, the product of two matrices um, and then quantity inverse is B inverse A inverse. Now, this equation, um, this, this is all the inverses here have to, have to exist, right? So AB has to have an inverse, B has to have an inverse, A has to have an inverse, okay? So... But provided that happens, then this is the same thing. So inverse is like transpose. In other words, that when you apply it to a matrix, uh, matrix product, it's the same as applying the operation to the individual matrices in the reverse order, right? So uh, that's how that works. Um, transpose and inverse. So A transpose inverse is equal to A inverse transpose. And then some people actually write that A to the minus, tra A minus transpose. So, um, so that's how they... That, 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 that some people would write it that way. You, you would see that in papers and books and things like that. Okay, um, now we can also talk, now that we have, uh, remember that we, we, if we had a square matrix, we, we know what A is, we know what A squared is, and we know what A cubed is, and so on, right? Uh, we decided that A to the zero is I, and now we have assigned a meaning to A inverse. Um, well, we can also have an, a meaning now for A to the minus two, 
uh, and that's going to be a inverse squared, and so on. So though now we can now we can talk about the powers, positive or negative, of a matrix that's square and invertible. If it's not invertible but just square, we can talk about its zeroth power, first power, second power, and so on. Okay. Um, now, with this definition of these inverses, you get this beautiful thing that holds for numbers as well. It says that a matrix to the k times a matrix to the l gives you a to the k plus l. So the exponents add when you take a product. Um, and that holds even if k and l are negative, positive, doesn't matter. Okay, so that's kind of the, it's a pretty, it's a pretty picture. And this is, this is one case where the formula, where a formula for numbers uh, actually holds for matrices, right? So that it, it generalizes out. But you have to be very much on your, very much on your toes because some things don't. <clears throat> All right, so we're going to talk about triangular matrices <clears throat> for a good, for a particular reason. Um, triangular matrices, they come up a whole, uh, in, in a lot of applications. Um, actually, we already saw one. Uh, we saw one in the so-called QR factorization. When you run Gram-Schmidt, you factor a matrix A into uh, a matrix Q and a matrix R, which is upper triangular. So, so we've already seen triangular matrices. Okay, so here it is. Um, a matrix is called lower triangular um, if it, what it means is, it means this, uh, so it means that here's, here's the matrix, it's got to be square, um, and it says you can have stuff, you can have non-zero things on the diagonal here, so on the, on the diagonal, and everything down here is potentially allowed to be non-zero, but it has to be zero in the upper triangle, so that's what it means to be lower triangular. Um, and the claim is this, um, if you have a lower triangular matrix with non-zero diagonal entries, it's invertible, okay? Now, we have to show that. Um, now, the way we're gonna show it is to show that the columns of X are, uh, in, I'm sorry, the columns of L are linearly independent. That's how we're gonna show that. Um, and to do that, what we're gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna actually write down LX equals zero and end up with the following conclusion, X equals zero. That's the same as showing the columns of L are independent because LX equals zero means a linear combination of the columns of L are zero with coefficients x, and we want to show the only coefficients that do that are x equals zero. That's that's what we want to do. Okay, so we write down the equations this way. This is this is now written out, and let's take a look at it. Well, actually, it's the first equation is fine because that's just a product of two numbers. L11 times x1 is zero, but we're assuming L11 is non-zero, so x1 is zero. That's awesome because it means you see this first column. It just goes away. They're all zero. Let's look, if you look at the second equation here, it says that L21X1 plus L22X2 is zero. But wait a minute. X1 is zero. We know we, we already figured that out. So this says L22X2 equals zero. X2 has got to be zero because L22 is non-zero. Okay. And you keep going. Uh, and what this shows is that the only way, if you have LX equals zero, that can happen is X equals zero. That says the columns of L are linearly independent. And that says that L is invertible. It's got an inverse. Okay. Um, now, same thing for upper triangular R uh, with a non-zero diagonal entry. The same, because it's the transpose of a lower triangular matrix. Okay. So, triangular matrices with non-zero uh, entries on the diagonal are invertible. By the way, a triangular matrix with a zero on the diagonal is not invertible. Okay. Now we can get the inverse and... Sure enough, it's going to be the one algorithm that we already looked at. In fact, it's pretty much the only algorithm we're going to use in the course. It's the QR factorization or Gram-Schmidt. Okay, so suppose A is square and invertible. That means its columns are linearly independent. That means if we run Gram-Schmidt, it will run to completion. And that says we'll end up with a factorization. And it's going to look like A equals QR. Um, that's why it's called the QR factorization. Um, Q is orthogonal, right? Its columns are orthogonal. Uh, and that means that Q transpose Q equals I. It, Q is square. Uh, okay. Uh, and R is upper triangular with positive diagonal entries. If you remember, the diagonal entries were the norms of something like the norms of the Q tildes or something like that, uh, which was an intermediary before being in the Gram-Schmidt algorithm, before being normalized. And the point is they're non-zero. Uh, and so it's, it's invertible. Okay. And that says this. Now it's going to get, you know, it says A inverse is... A is QR, inverse of that. Both Q and R are invertible. We know that. 
In fact, it's R inverse is the first one, and Q inverse. But Q is orthogonal. It satisfies this. And so that says its inverse is its transpose. So here it is. It's R inverse, Q transpose. There you go. So, so uh, this says we can get um, the inverse via QR factorization. Actually, I haven't yet quite said how to get R inverse, but that's coming. We're going to get that in just a minute.